Good morning. Oh, it's both great and terrible to follow Rob because I just want him to keep talking and uh, me not have to talk as much. But I also want to hear from our panelists, so I'm going to push forward. Um, let's see, I think this should just go to my slide deck. Oh, we got, we got a minute, or I'll, I'll vamp a little bit then. Um, first things first, I just want to say um, thank you to the NSF and to the uh, workshop coordinators for featuring cybersecurity this, uh, this prominently. We think it's a really important issue. And we also think that there's a lot of um, topics that are going to be interesting, not just to the sort of like in the weeds techies, but to the whole, um, you know, major facility sort of like management structure. So um, again, appreciate featuring this. So uh, hello, my name is Scott Russell. Uh, I am the uh, program lead for the Trusted CI Frameworks. It's one of the things uh, Rob just highlighted in his talk. And my goal today is actually not to talk very much, but to let my panelists talk. But in order to do that effectively, I think there's a couple of kind of like background uh, information uh, topics that I want to make sure I give you at least an intro to. If you have heard me speak before, a lot of this is going to be sort of a you know, broken record, but I think I see enough new faces that I'm hoping this will be valuable as well. So hoping not to spend too much time. But what I want to do is go into a little bit more detail about some of the things that Rob was talking about that includes the Trusted CI Framework and some of the expansions we've taken recently, which include framework cohorts with the major facilities and now the community of practice, which we're just now uh, are ramping up. And then what we really want to do is give you a chance to hear from some of the on, on the ground perspectives about just the realities that uh, these major facilities are facing as they're actually standing up cybersecurity programs. And then, of course, we always have a self serving uh, desire to get more framework adopters. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you are a major facility and you haven't heard about and you haven't adopted the framework yet, come talk to us. We'll, uh, we'll get you hooked up. Okay, so starting off with a little bit about the trusted CI framework. Uh, I give a little bit of background here because I think it's helpful. Um, as you know, Rob mentioned, one of some of the things that Trusted CI does is for you know many years now we've been conducting assessments, training, other kinds of engagements, consultations with the NSF funded research community, especially among the major facilities, you know, formerly large facilities. Um, but we have a pretty broad base for um, forming some of these opinions. And over this time period, one of the things we found is that the primary challenges that we were seeing were not in the weeds technical things. It wasn't that people didn't know how to solve the specific technical problems. They were having challenges at the programmatic level, what we would call the programmatic level. This could be things like money, it could be governance, it could be getting your leadership involved. But it wasn't, oh, I don't know how to go implement multi-factor, it's I don't have the people to do it, or I can't get my leadership to buy in to uh, give you the support, and instead they're gonna say like, oh, it sounds like a hassle, <laughs> Some of the uh, people aren't going to like it. And so I don't have the supports. So we can't actually get the cybersecurity work done. So we see the problems arising at the programmatic level. <laughs> and one of the other things we found during these engagements is that uh, where the people we were engaging with just didn't have the tools or the guidance to know how to address these non-technical elements of cybersecurity, right? There's a lot of control sets out there that'll tell you, here's all the good cybersecurity in the weeds technical stuff you should do. But there wasn't a whole lot about like, how do you handle money? How do you handle governance? How do you actually inv involve your leadership in a way that makes sense for your facility? Um, and then another one of the big motivators is I'm not going to talk much about this is that there is the kind of constant cloud of maybe some kind of cybersecurity compliance is on the way. Uh, we, we hear about this pretty frequently. Some major, some facilities actually already have some of these, but you know, if you know, CUI and 800171, you may have heard about the cybersecurity maturity model certification, CMMC, you know, we heard about NSPM 33 yesterday and also the Chips and Science Act. Um, in general, when we have seen cybersecurity compliance, they focus very much on the technical, right? It's long lists of controls you have to go and do. Um, they are rarely tailored for research organizations. This is something we, we heard about earlier as well. But I think the point we really want to emphasize here is even if these things are inevitable, and we hope that they aren't, but um, if you don't have a cybersecurity program and you are handed a big list of controls, you are really gonna struggle just to even get started because you don't have the resources to go do the work or you don't have the expertise and you're, just gonna, you're going to find yourself with a lot of challenges. So that's all background motivation for why we're talking about this framework. So the Trusted CI framework is a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. And the goal of the cybersecurity program then is to address this, uh, you know, these higher level programmatic elements, not in the weeds technical. So um, it breaks down into 16 clear and concise requirements. We call them musts, but it is a, you know, it's a voluntary framework. So this, we're not being, no one is forced to be do these, to do these things. 
Um, it's based on our best practices, evidence of what worked, and again, our experience uh, engaging with this community. And one of the other nice things, it's designed to be universal and timeless. So this is not a technical standard that's going to change when the technology changes. These are the sort of things that should always be true. Uh, you heard about this from Rob earlier, but it has four pillars. Uh, mission alignment, governance, resources, and controls. I mentioned already, not a long list of technical requirements. These are programmatic. I'm not going to go through all 16 of them. That's a different talk that I'm not going to try and give today. But I will kind of highlight um, like the level that we're talking about. So like must seven is you have to have a cybersecurity lead or someone who is in charge of cybersecurity for the facility, right? Or must uh, 12 is you have to have a cybersecurity budget. These are, these are very basic programmatic requirements that um, I, I don't think we, we have not gotten any pushback on from any of the people we've engaged with thus far. Okay, I'm not going to go through my the whole laundry list of why you should adopt, but one of the two, a couple of things I definitely want to highlight. The first one is this is a doable framework. We designed it fundamentally to be something you can achieve, right? A lot of times the, the compliance sets, they're just like, well, this is what security means because someone said that someone said, you know, they're just doing, uh, they're passing along something that they've heard from somewhere else, um, and it, it's onerous. This is designed to be, because it's a minimum standard, something you can actually go out and do. Um, we've heard already, but it's designed fundamentally to support your mission. It's not checkbox compliance. There's a lot of flexibility built into the requirements so you can actually get stuff done in a way that makes sense for your facility. And I'm going to skip down to the bottom just for the sake of time, but emphasize that the kind of things we're talking about here are at a level that they are much more understandable by your organization's leadership. Uh, if you go and you, you, know, you bring up some like uh, you know, a control, like a technical control, uh, they, I mean, even sometimes we'll look at them and be like, hold on a second, what exactly is this talking about? Uh, the must should all be at a level where you look at that and you say, okay, I'm pretty sure I know what that's talking about. Maybe some of the nuances we'll have to flesh out, but you should be able to understand it without a big background in cybersecurity. Okay, so that's the framework generally. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the recent events that we've been doing with the framework. So um, the kind of uh, big initiative over the past coming on two years now, which is kind of crazy to think about, is these uh, engagements called framework cohorts. So as we mentioned, as you know, Rob mentioned earlier, Trusted CI has a long history of engaging with this community, but often it was in a one-on-one -on -one manner. And we found that scaling just became a challenge. And so um, we designed this uh, new program, which is basically small group engagements. Over a six month period, we would bring together roughly four to six uh, major facilities, mid scales as well. And these were very focused engagements on framework adoption implementation. So we were going to you know, set out to um, figure out exactly how you're doing on each of those 16 musts and then basically help you chart a path forward. Uh, a couple of the strengths of this model. One, because it's a group engagement, it's not just you know, you're talking with trusted CI and you're getting our opinion. You're actually he hearing from all of your, not all, but uh, a, a subset of your fellow major facilities and you hear when you have common challenges, when you have different challenges, kind of like what Rob was saying with like the, you know, the, the hallway track. Um, you still get the opportunity for in-depth trusted CI guidance. And also it's just a lower time commitment than a full assessment. This, uh, we, we scoped it very specifically to be a relatively limited ask for the participants. All right, uh, a little bit more about the framework cohort. These are ongoing, um, but we will focus on adoption. Everyone adopts the framework. That's a, that's a pretty low bar. Adoption just, is just a commitment to actually do it. You go then and do a program evaluation. You say, how am I doing on these 16 MUSs? I'll show you a little graphic about kind of what that looks like. And then we'll help you draft a strategic plan, which fundamentally connects your cybersecurity to the organization's mission and then charts a course forward with the mission in mind. So it's, again, very mission focused. So this is an example. This is not anyone's real ratings. And we just put it together to show kind of what these ratings would look like. There's 16 MUSs. And we give you um, uh, implementation rating, which goes from not implementing, which means you're not doing it. Green is the one you want, at least. That's implementing. You've met the minimum standard. Blue is optimizing, which means you're going above and beyond. And then the orange is, well, you're not fully doing it yet, but you've actually made significant progress or you've proven you've got a plan to get this done. So we've engaged with quite a few facilities at this point. I'm not going to read them all off. But you can see over the cohorts um, all the different facilities. We've got major facilities. We've got mid-scales. We also have a couple of other um, kind of like closely related science projects, you might call them. And uh, we've got another cohort coming up uh, this uh, next semester as well. Uh, a couple of key findings I just want to highlight from the cohort process. And I'm going to again, go through this very quickly because I want to give the panel a chance to talk. 
Um, some notable strengths that we saw in our engagement uh, with this community, one, mission focus, the people we're engaging with really understood the science mission. We did not get a whole lot of, you know, very checkbox compliancy. You know, I, I have to do this because I have to do this. They, people understood, we're trying to enable science, we're trying to be open, but also secure. We need to figure out how to do that. Leadership involvement uh, writ large was pretty good along, among the major facilities. Um, use of external resources was fantastic. This is a community that definitely takes advantage of the things that are made uh, available for them. But um, just some, you know, going into some of the practicalities, none of the major facilities we have engaged with yet has met the minimum standard, which is implementing for all 16 MUSs, right? They've always had gaps in our engagements thus far. That being said, um, it wasn't all bad. You know, every major facility was at least implementing some of the MUSs. Um, but also each of them had at least one where they were not implementing, you know, not implementing being our sort of uh, technical term of art. Um, overall, the biggest challenge area we saw was in MUST 11, which is about getting adequate resources, which is like, does the cybersecurity program have enough resources to mitigate unacceptable risk? And um, we found that was a real challenge. And one of the most common asks is we need more people, right? The cybersecurity personnel is a really big challenge. And, you know, we have a separate must about personnel, but it just says you need to have some people. And what we heard was, yeah, we've got some people. We need some more people. Um, final point I want to emphasize here is that the strategic planning process um, proved to be really valuable among the major facilities. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on it in helping to do that tailoring to make the program more mission focused. So we, we had the mission awareness and this was a process to really align all of those together. Uh, I think this is almost my last slide, I promise. Um, the most recent update is we, the cohorts were so successful and the groups really liked meeting and learning from each other and engaging that we didn't want to let that drop. And so we've um, basically spun this, these cohorts off into what we're calling a community of practice. The name is actually probably going to be a massage a little bit, but we've been you know, informally calling it community of practice, which is a group of you know, practitioners, cybersecurity practitioners from this community who have successfully completed one of these framework cohorts and they will continue to meet in an ongoing manner. We want to continue the momentum from these engagements. We also want to have an opportunity to build expertise among NSF cybersecurity practitioners. This provides a, you know, basically a secure space where they feel comfortable sharing their experiences, their challenges, vulnerabilities, but also their successes and any resources that they might have to make available. And it's just uh, it's a forum to solve problems as well. And uh, one of the things we think maybe in the future, this could be a platform to kind of speak uh, with one voice as a community. And okay, this is my last slide, I think. And this is just a number of resources that Trusted CI makes available. I'm not gonna go over them in detail, but we got a framework implementation guide that just walks through the 16 must in greater detail, focused for research infrastructure operators. And then we have a, a number of templates and tools available on the Trusted CI website. Um, and we highlight some of the really important ones we think here. And so with that, I will hopefully talk less and uh, let the panel talk more. So I'm gonna start off by just asking each of the panels to introduce themselves. And uh, Eric, you're closest. So can you take, kick things off? Yes, good morning. My name is Eric Cross. I'm the head of information technology at the National Solar Observatory. Uh, we recently commissioned the DKIS Solar Telescope, which is our largest facility that we operate. Um, so I started while it was in construction, I've seen it go into operation, so I've got an interesting perspective of that facility at this point. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Jerry Brower. I'm the uh, cybersecurity team lead for Noir Lab. Um, I've been uh, with Noir Lab and grew into this uh, uh, cybersecurity lead role. Um, I will pass it on because <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the rare moments I uh, lost talking. So <laughs> you'll warm up. We'll, we'll make note of that. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Morrison. I'm the head of IT operations for, for Noir Lab. Uh, my previous role, I was the, the information technology manager for the Gemini Observatory. Um, so those of you who know Noir Lab, uh, you know, well, maybe don't know Noir Lab, uh, it's, a, it's a new organization. We just brought a bunch of uh, smaller major facilities together under one big roof, if you will. And um, yeah, so it's an interesting time for us to, to be looking at cybersecurity and extending cybersecurity from one program into, into this, this larger um, you know, major facility that is, uh, is Noir Lab. So it's an interesting challenge. <clears throat> Craig Jackson, um, I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University. More relevant here, I've been part of uh, the trusted CI team since the beginning of the, the first award. 
um, and uh, spent a lot of my trusted CI time over the years doing assessments, mostly with major facilities, but also with, with universities and, and other operators. Um, and I'm the primary architect of the Trusted CI framework. So if anybody wants to beat up on it, you, know, you can direct that to me. Um, I do want to note really quickly, too, you have, and this kind of goes back to Marone's question, you've got major facilities represented here. Part of why we drug these guys into this meeting is not, not specifically because they're major facilities, but because uh, they went through the, the cohort process earlier and so they've had more time to kind of be impacted positively or negatively by that. Um, uh, we've, we've definitely been diversifying the kind of organizations that have been participating in the cohort. And I, and I have to say some of the most incredible engagements have actually been with mid-scales where we've seen them make changes like during the cohort, like really start to, to accelerate their program. So um, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. All right, so what I want to say is we've got a pretty good uh, chunk of time, and I want to make sure that we have a chance to answer audience questions. So um, I'm going to kind of open the floor. So if you have questions, be thinking about them. But I will use my moderator privilege to kick off with the first one, which could be a, a pretty meaty conversation. So we heard Rob talk about, and, uh, and I think this is something that we're all familiar with, is that the NSF has historically taken what we might call like a lighter approach to imposing requirements on the major facilities. And I think this is something that was pretty heavily validated in the Jason report as well. But I want to open it up to the panel. How, how do you think NSF is doing when it comes to setting requirements? Do you think that they've hit the right balance? Are there areas where you think maybe, maybe a little bit more requirements could be valuable? And also, are there any areas where you think more requirements would actually be harmful and to stay away from it? And I'm going to throw to Jerry first. I guess. <laughs> okay, I guess uh, talking power is restored. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think um, I think the 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 lighter touch is uh, is kind of okay. I mean, I'd like to I'd like to see a little bit more. Um, a little bit more, I guess, protection of uh, NSF's uh, investments in us, uh, a little bit more or, or firmer, I guess, uh, wow, uh, uh, it, not enforcement, because I think the the area where it could be uh, too much is we don't want to get into uh, compliance for compliance sake, right? Uh, one of the, the nice things that he's already mentioned about the framework is that it is very highly uh, mission focused. And when we went through the cohort, it even becomes more clear as uh, they in engaged with our directorate, which was really good in order to allow us to get uh, a buy-in from up high uh, effortlessly. Um, but it actually focused our cybersecurity efforts in areas that that mattered for the mission, right? That mattered for the science um, and uh, clarified our cybersecurity program in, in a way that was just incredible. Because uh, of course, you, you always come out of this with the um, uh, the uh, uh, mission plan, I guess the strategic plan. Um, and uh, we've actually implemented a way of like, uh, continuing that, updating that constantly, and actually we've actually had a cohort um, anniversary, I guess, where we went through and you saw the report card and you get to actually get a, a um, an upgraded uh, <laughs> assessment. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to add um, a point there. Actually, something that... Um, and that shows up, uh, and Rob, you mentioned this, it's uh, is a very strong focus on on the scientific part of um, you know, cybersecurity. And of course, it's important. That's the primary focus. Uh, but there is also a, a very strong um, requirement for, for major facilities. In fact, for every, every facility, doesn't uh, you, you made this distinction between um, yeah, the, the, the enterprise and science. And for, for a, lot of, a lot of us, uh, there's no distinction. You know, we have to look at both sides. So when we're implementing um, you know, the, the, the cybersecurity framework or developing a cybersecurity strategic plan, 
we're looking at everything. Yeah, you know, we we have to run the servers. We have to deliver email. We have to you know we have to run laptops. Um, so of course, while there is a very strong focus on the science side, a lot of times it can be uh, disconnected because you know the IT teams are not necessarily directly connected to the science teams, or the science teams have their own ideas, their own plans. So uh, it, this is important for us, you know, to get that engagement um, uh, with the leadership in our organization. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, this, this, yeah, we're actually talking you know, direct, uh, directly to the, to the directors, uh, multiple directors or the program directors within Noir Lab. Uh, and, and they understand where we're coming from. And that's been great for us to, to be able to push this forward. But it also, you know, we had to show them how important this was that, that we look at cybersecurity across the board and not just focus on the science side. Yeah. But, Something breaks in the enterprise side, as a strong potential is going to break something on the science side. So that was that was important for us. Okay, so I wanted to point out that I worked in the DoD space between 2009 and 2015. The DoD was really upping their game as far as cybersecurity was concerned. While I was there, um, we were under NISPOM requirements, so was, the control sets were very restrictive, very. Um, Precise, I'll say. And so I went, when I moved into this leadership role at the NSO, um, I looked at our cooperative agreement. And at the time, I think the, the kind of the guide that we followed was the manufacturer, uh, uh, let's see, the, the major facilities guide. It has section 6.3 in it, which was, you know, you, sh you should have a cybersecurity program was kind of the, the gist of that section. So it, you know, left quite a, quite of a broad view on what I should do, and I felt a little bit directionless. Um, now with the updated rig, I feel like the NSF is going in a much better direction. Um, like Jerry said, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, quite an expens in expensive investment uh, uh, at the DKIS facility, and I want to make sure I am demonstrating to the NSF I have a good program. So I feel like um, while I don't want, you know, a strict audit like I was getting at the, the DOD facilities I worked at, um, I would like to be able to demonstrate to NSF, hey, you know, we have our ducks in a row. We have a very um, good program. We're following the, the trusted CIs framework precisely and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I'm still looking for a little more guidance and directive from the NSF. I'm just not quite sure how to, to you know, strike the right balance there. I'll just add, and obviously I'm extremely biased on this, but uh, you know I think uh, NSF has all you know th that's it's been very consistent in uh, not bringing a heavy duty compliance mindset to this community, um, and I think that's very wise. Um, if you know you look around the rest of most of the rest of the federal government, you see a completely different approach, and I can tell you, and, and I think this is unequivocally true even for DOD, that very intensive compliance checklist at the technical level mindset has been very wasteful. I think it's been a disaster in many cases. So, um, you know, I, I'd strongly encourage this community to keep on, on kind of that end of the spectrum. And I, I do think over the years we've seen some more specificity. I think when, when we first started Trusted CI, there was no cybersecurity. Uh, in the major facilities guide or whatever it was called. Then. Now it's the rig. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a gradual move to more of a standard and not a strict set of rules. And I, I, we might be getting to a sweet spot. I'm sure there will be tweaks over time. But, you know, the Jason report, everybody I've ever talked to at NSF, and for the most part in the community, I think people really benefit from, you know, being able to evolve this thing with more of a standard hmm. and more of a set of fundamental practices rather than that giant checklist. That's where I stand on it. Um, yeah, I'll add to that as well. I mean, for, for us, we were really happy to see something appear in, in the rig you know, about cybersecurity. In fact, we've, we've been asking for this for, for a long time, and it's like having any, um, any language in the, in the major facilities guide on that, the rig yeah, about cybersecurity, it was a great thing. It was like, you know, finally we've got something we can actually lean on and say, look, oh, they're, they're telling us we need to have cybersecurity. It's not just us uh, in, in the IT department, because you know, we're, we're just IT, we don't have, well, we now have a cybersecurity uh, team, but at the time it was just IT. So 
uh, it's the IT people going to, to upper management and director and saying, oh yeah, look, we, we need cybersecurity. And so, well, of course you do, you've got a firewall, what's, what's wrong? Yeah. Um, and of course, without understanding you know, all of the other the parts that's, that's going on there. So we're really happy to have this information in there and we're really looking forward to that being updated. Honestly, we'd be quite happy if it was more strict, to be honest, but that's fine. We kind of get that as well, that you know, we have to start somewhere. Um, Do we not beat you up enough from Trusted CI? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> One point I wanted to make about the rig, it's not really clear from my leadership's perspective whether or not all of it applies to them. I've been told, you know, we agreed to a cooperative agreement, the uh, major facility guide at a certain time, it didn't have this language. Why should I do this? You know, that's, that's something I've seen at, uh, at the NSO. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I want to reiterate, it's really fantastic to not have uh, compliance as, for compliance sake weigh, weighing down, but it is incredibly valuable to have uh, a guidance and direction for the cybersecurity thing. But um, I also think that, uh, I guess, recent things in the news, I don't know if I mentioned by name, but, but uh, you know, something like uh, uh, what happened to Alma, right? actually cost that organization a very significant uh, portion of money. Uh, Noir Lab had a incident uh, this year that was uh, from state actors and it turned out to be um, nothing that was a compromise. It took a lot of our uh, time on it, uh, knocking it down, keeping it down, but I credit that to uh, cybersecurity preparedness mm -hmm. from this whole process that for us, uh, it ended up just being uh, an annoyance and a uh, amount of time that we had to spend doing this and uh, making a little after report and explaining to people what happened. But it didn't turn it into something that had us in the news or, right, because Director do care about re reputation, um, but for uh, NSF, right, it didn't actually cost them significant money for this event that could have been very, very bad. So it's it, it, it's paying paying an upfront amount to not have it. It's not quite insurance, but it's uh, yeah, it's valuable. It has value. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll uh, just to that point as well. As well, and I'll add that you know, when we went through the the, the process of the you know, implementing the framework, I mean, we, we talked about the point there that um, you have resources and resources missing, resources of course that everybody's struggling with, um, uh, and one of the things is actually having somebody dedicated to cybersecurity. And you know, so we set up the cybersecurity team, and you know, which uh, which Jerry is is leading. Um, Having that cybersecurity team within our organization, which is still part of the IT team, you know, we, um, they have a day job, but uh, apart from that, they have the cybersecurity um, side as well. But having the team available to, to be able to respond to that incident, you know, definitely made things a, a whole lot, uh, a whole lot better. So just this point, a lot of this is just words here that, that we see in the framework, but, you know, when it's actually um, converted into, into real actions, actually having a team that can respond to an incident, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And it's something that, you know, this is the first time, you know, Hopefully we don't have too many incidents, but yeah, we know we're, we're, everybody's exposed. Uh, but it was great to have that. So really converting words into you know, real uh, actions, and it was yeah, huge. It's great. Yeah. So yeah, I, I wear multiple hats, right? Even as the lead, I'm still wearing multiple hats, right? So the the cybersecurity um, uh, commitment doesn't have to be. Oh my God, I'm going to have to hire a ton of of full-time people, right? You take uh, a little bit of time for multiple people and what you get is a, a bunch of brains when needed, right? So when this happened, we had a bunch of brains that we could put onto the uh, the thing. Actually, yeah, and, and we had uh, uh, trusted CI, we could always ask, um, and in fact, even uh, some of the cohort people we could ask if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think as you'll probably have noticed, when we get the panel going, they'll 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 keep it rolling. But um, so I want to say um, I'm keeping an eye out for hands. So if people have questions throughout, absolutely, I see oh. Oh, a couple already. Hey, uh, let me let me mention though. Uh, Jerry mentioned Alma, and I believe we're going to hear more directly, uh, you know, about that story tomorrow. So if it, if if the kind of incident world is of interest, be sure to to attend that.
All right, yeah, we'll, we'll take, a, I think I saw two hands come up pretty quickly. So I have a pretty broad question. So I, I work for Aura, and we oversee a few facilities, including a NASA facility. Um, I think it was Craig mentioned, you know, that we're comfortable with not having a rigorous cybersecurity framework like CMMC. Mm -hmm. um, CMMC evolved, I mean, and, and Eric, you mentioned the CMS, CMMC evolved, I mean, 10, I want to say 15 years ago, there wasn't CMMC on the DOD side. You know, that evolved over time. And eventually it started out with NIST and people, the owner, the onus wasn't on contractors to comply. And that evolved over time as the framework was developed. Um, so if, if NSF isn't requiring a cybersecurity framework, then that gap of what the requirements are often lies with the, the administrator of the federal facility. So if it's a big university, for example, they have lots of resources and they're going to implement standards and practices across all their centers. Um, we did that at Johns Hopkins. When it's a, you know, an independent nonprofit like Aura, there's lots of other federal facilities, we're responsible for that gap between what the NSF implements and what our, you know, figuring out what the risk is across our facilities. And a lot of that gap we try to fill with cybersecurity insurance policies. But it's expensive. It's a there's a cost to that. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of unknowns in trying to um, understand what the NSF is requiring, what the, fa the facility can implement, and what then what the gaps are left that we need to make sure are filled. So I think it's, you know, when you talk, Eric was mentioning the DOD environment, you have some level of certainty because you know that everybody's adhering to certain practices. And I, I know that's onerous and that's, that's the, having the checklist is, is onerous sometimes. But then there's a, a, the unknowns that you don't know what the, where the gaps are. If there's no, there's no reporting requirement, there's no checklist, there's no, uh, there's no details. And so far, I, I know it's a, the astronomical community hasn't had to, you know, there's been one major cybersecurity incident. So I, I like to ask the panel about like, what do you think are the, the big gaps where you, what keeps you up at night, where you feel like if, if you don't figure it out, if you, you know, if you're, you're the one responsible as a cybersecurity professional, what are those big gaps that you're worried about that you, you would like to express to say, hey, we need, we need to figure this problem out? All right, I'll throw it to Craig first because we're talking CMMC. I know he's going to oh, chomp I, I, a bit. What a, what a train wreck that is. So um, I, I don't think we need to talk a lot about CMMC. C, all CMMC does is pr provide an, another list of controls. And the way it's evolved, you know, what is it, level three is basically just 800-171 or something, right? So it's just, a lo it's just one of those laundry lists of controls, right? Um, Programmatically, the Trusted CI framework, MUST 15 says, organization needs to adopt and use a baseline control set. It doesn't say which one to, to adopt and use, but it says you need one. Well, CMMC has however many levels it currently has, right? So an organization might rationally, reasonably, I don't know, but maybe rationally might choose, well, for our control set, we wanna we want to use 800-171, or we wanna use one of the CMMC levels. Um, uh, because you do need at the technical level and at the specific level a, a set of practices that you're going to work toward implementing. Uh, what we typically recommend to, like, well, not typically, what we, what, what we always recommend, what I always recommend to organizations who have a, have a choice in what baseline control set they pick is the CIS controls, Center for Internet Security. Most security practitioners I, I know who were not completely enculturated into uh, uh, federal cybersecurity believe that the CIS controls are the best. They're more prioritized. Uh, they're more clearly specified than like any of the NIST stuff. Um, and uh, we just find those to be much more usable, right? And I don't care if your control set is 50 items long or 900 items long, it takes a lot, look, to your point, it takes a lot of work, effort, and money to get even a dozen of those things implemented, much less 
90, right? Um, so having, having a control set that's highly prioritized for you is a, is a big plus because you have a much greater you know, chance of knowing where to start. The, the places, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with this, is that the, the places um, that keep me up at night are at the programmatic level when I see a really complex, big, major facility or mid-scale or port or you name it that doesn't have a cybersecurity lead. Or if they do have a cybersecurity lead, that person is not in a position to have a conversation with the people who control the budgets. Like that, that, that you, you know that organization is in trouble if that's not happen, happening. Down at the technical level, uh, you know, we are doing more research to try to figure out what truly are the most impactful, powerful controls in those long lists. And we know uh, from triangulating evidence-based research, some of this stuff is unpublished, that there are some of those things in those lists that are a lot more valuable and powerful than others. So one example that I don't think anybody will be surprised about is two-factor authentication. All the evidence suggests that is, you know, one of my colleagues uh, who works for the Indiana state government says it's not a silver bullet, but it's got some silver in it. It's, we, we know that is a super powerful control. So when we see organizations not doing that, uh, okay, we're concerned. Right, you got a great defense available to you. It's very doable for most organizations for most of their enterprise. If you're not doing it, wow, you're missing out. I'll stop there. Yeah, and, and I'll just, just add that, yeah, some of the things that, uh, that, that I worry about is, is the implementation. Yeah, we, we talked about resources, not having the resources available to, to do these things, uh, but resources are literally in, in time. Like we're saying, you know, Jerry and the team, they, they, they have a day job as well. They have the stuff that they you know, have to deal with, have to deal with a lot of users. There's a whole lot more users now. Uh, so, so that's the complication. You're know, getting to the point where we have a strategic plan. We know what we want to do. We know, uh, yeah, we know how we want to do this. But finding the time to do it, that's a difficult thing. So it does leave gaps, of course. Um, but we have to, to plan for that and, and, and try and coordinate. And I think a lot of the major facilities, um, and I think it's probably a little bit of a surprise, is that major facilities don't necessarily have the staff, all the knowledge, knowledgeable staff uh, on, on hand to be able to implement a lot of these the cybersecurity uh, features. Yeah, maybe because it was never a thing, right? With the, the major facilities guy, they, they, it, it was never a thing about cybersecurity. It's only now with the, you know, with the rig that it shows up and everybody's going, oh yeah, right, cybersecurity is a whole lot more than just, just the firewalls or just you know, something else. So we have to implement this now and you know, make it happen. And, but without having the staff on site, you're, you're going to have gaps. So talking about CMMC and, and going up to different levels, it's almost impossible because you can't even get to like the most basic level of cybersecurity before you can even think about you know, looking at CMMSC. So I'll just, I'll end there. So to follow up on that, how do you harmonize? If you're, you've got an HPC cluster and they've decided to implement sys controls and you've got a clinical environment in the mid scale um, that wants to use the HPC, um, even with, you know, de-identified data, which baseline do you, do you pick? How do you harmonize those baselines? And then how do you convince the researchers that, well, we're following SIS and we don't believe in CMMC and we don't believe in, in <clears throat> trying to hit 800-171. Um, so how do you, how do you come to um, a place where um, I feel comfortable <clears throat> using a cluster with SIS controls when half of my business is requiring me to meet CMMC or potentially at least 800-171 or 153 on campus. Or 50, we have a panelist who wants to take it. I can respond to that one actually pretty quickly from like a framework level. Um, because there is enough flexibility built into the framework, I mean, the, the challenge you're talking about is a real one and it's, it's kind of meta to the community, right? There's enough requirements out there that they can be overlapping and if they are not harmonized, then that's just a challenge that you basically are gonna have to deal with. At the framework level, we would say, look, we give you the flexibility, you pick the controls you want to implement, and sometimes you have to pick multiple control sets just for practical reasons, right? We've got the regulated stuff over here, maybe we've got a different set of regulated stuff over here, and we need the program maturity to be able to put some controls over here and some controls over here. Now, in the ideal world, you know, you get like the great crosswalk where you can just say, okay, I, 
I know I'd like this one means this, this one means this, I can do this, 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 and I cover all my bases. That's the dream. There's some practical challenges there that I think make that more like not a reality right now. But but yeah, I think at a at a really basic level, Don, it's you know when we talk about these different baseline control sets, there's a ton of overlap between them, right? Part, part of the different values that they have is how, how they're framed, how they've been constructed, whether they've been constructed in an evidence-based way or people went into a dark room and just came out with something, right? Um, but you can, you know, you don't have to do the crosswalk to figure out how they translate to each other yourself. There's lots of accurate crosswalks out there. So if you're, if, so, you know, if you're doing CIS implementation group two, I, I can't remember exactly, but you, you are doing a whole lot of 800-171, right? So it does take a little work to kind of see where that overlap is, but a, a lot of organizations have put in the time to do that work for you. I think I think one really key thing, right, is is if you're in an environment where you could take a more onerous or a, a heavier standard, right, and potentially apply it across the board, like let's just take the hardest thing that we have to do and do it everywhere, you, you, you have to do some benefit cost analysis, right? Does it make sense to, you know, let, I'll give you a crazy example. Like what, you know, the U.S. Navy, do they do classified work? Yeah. Does that mean that they classify every single thing, like the cafeteria menu is top secret? No, right? They, they, they've chosen to, to put those higher standards more in enclaves, right? To, to keep costs down, to allow people to communicate about something, right? So um, I, I, think, I think that's a, that's a key calculus, right? So if, so if a university is looking at something like CUI and 800-171 and saying, well, you know, maybe, that, maybe we should just do that for the whole university. Okay, let's talk about benefit cost here because you might just want to carve off a special place to apply that standard, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Actually, actually, I'll say, um, right, so, so some of the thing you were talking about is like hitting those basic compliance, <laughs> some compliance standards, right? I mean, if it is uh, an actual need, then I guess you, you have to, but... For most of us, for most of the facilities, it's it's not really about compliance. It's about uh, custodianship. It's about you know being a good steward of the of the the data and the science. And you know C the CIS came from the top twenty, right? So it it's based in reality, I guess, better than some of these other compliance ones that are based on I don't know uh, some dartboard that uh, sounded cool or something. But um, it actually has more of a benefit to your organization. And, and like I said, when you look at, uh, and even if you go through the process, if you're lucky enough to be able to go through the process uh, with the cohorts, you see where the various controls are going to have the biggest impact, the, the biggest uh, 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 effectiveness for your dollar to your actual mission, Right. And so if your goal is to use the, your money right to have the best impact to your uh, organization and to the things that really, really matter, right, then you, you do this. But if you're forced for some uh, other ob legal obligation to hit uh, some sort of compliance standard, then I guess your hands are tied. But the crosswalks, 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 if you really need to. All right, we'll take uh, one more question. I do have one other big topic area I want to get to, but go ahead, Nate. Well, I mean, so um, I hear you guys say it doesn't matter. You don't, we want less compliance, but this is actually the opposite of what I hear from my users, right? Everybody asks me for CUI, period, right? So I have hundreds of, yeah, no, this is what they're doing. So we're, we're getting CUI requests all the time, right? They don't know. They've been told that that's what they're required to follow. And CUI for them is 171 Rev 2, right? So, I mean, this is where we're moving to as a community. And I think we, we must address this as a thing, right? Every researcher is being told, cooey or else. 
I think a really good bit, a bit of uh, context there. One thing I will say about CUI, I mean, we talked about this in, in, uh, in previous contexts as well, but we often will say is this was not designed as a standard for research. That is, that was not its goal, that is not its intent. Um, it is fundamentally like a distillation of some of the FISMA requirements uh, for confidentiality. And I think when we generally talk about the research community, especially the major facilities, which is you know our primary engagements thus far, it's it's integrity number one, availability number two, and confidentiality. It kind of varies, you know, depending on the specifics of the facility. So there is definitely this sort of environmental factor that CUI is a is a big element in the space right now. But we've all we've also been pretty. Uh, firm to push back on any sort of requirement in that way, just because we think it's not well tailored for this community. Yeah, and I just, you know, you, you might be right, Nate, but I've, I, I've not seen evidence to suggest that it, it's that bad, right? So I, I it, well, that's not coming from NSF. No, I was, I was going to say that the, the, the framework that, and, and also the language in, in the rig as well, I mean, it, it talks a lot about mission alignment, right? So uh, if, if, there is, if that is part of the, the mission and that isn't what you're doing, then you, you have no way around it. You, you have to implement, basically. That's, that's pretty much as simple as that. And I think, it, again, it's the same thing. You can lean on, on, on the rig for this and, and you just have to implement it. I don't think there's any way around it. <laughs> I, I, and we're going to hear from from the regulated research community of practice, I, I, I ask this question again, right? You'll have even even better subject matter expertise um, to you know to talk about this, but I, I think you know RR COP is an example. But I, I part of the hope here is that the community can band together and work and push back together where it's appropriate to push back. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, pushing to uh, RR Cops presentation later is a good call just because I'm looking at the clock and I want to make sure we at least hit one more. I had I, I planned more <laughs> questions than I had any chance of ever getting to. Um, I want to talk a little bit about everyone's other favorite topic, which is money. And um, basically, one of the most common challenges we see when we're engaging with facilities is uh, resources, right? It's just it's the money. And I'm, I'm curious just to get some of the perspectives of on the ground realities about like budgeting process as it relates to cybersecurity. Uh, what are the challenges you see there? What are some of the strategies that you found to be successful? Is this an area where maybe some more um, uh, firepower from NSF could be valuable? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so the, the NSO is about 175 employees. Uh, we are, our agreements have always included very broad language, you need cybersecurity. We have zero funding lines in IT or anywhere in our budget for cybersecurity, uh, zero. I'm, my title is head of information technology. We are purely best effort. Um, and before I arrived six years ago, that was nothing as far as I could tell. There was no organized cybersecurity going on at the NSO. Um, so it's a struggle. Um, going through the cohort has been a, a real blessing for us. We've, uh, we've managed to secure uh, a half FTE dedicated to cybersecurity um, based on the results from the cohort, um, which is great. However, it's, it is like pulling teeth. You know, I have to really beg and plead to, to the program leaders asking for funds. And it's a, it's a struggle because I've been told on uh, multiple occasions, hey, that's not in uh, what I agreed to. It's, I don't have any funding set aside for it, um, which I find is just almost ludicrous, right? We, we, uh, we all know cybersecurity is important. Um, we all know travel is important. We have budget line items for travel. Uh, it's just, uh, I find it odd that there's no um, budget for cybersecurity in our organization. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to, to, to the Gemini days uh, before before Noir Lab. Yeah, we were struggling as well, like everybody else, with uh, budget and you know, resource availability for, uh, for cybersecurity. Uh, and we were trying to figure out ways that would uh, make it more visible to, to upper management uh, when we were developing this plan, because we've been working with trusted CI. 
And uh, the, the, the plan that we came up with that worked really well was um, to, to show these individual uh, cybersecurity items as projects, you know, actually show them, because everybody understands project management, they understand, okay, oh, that project's gonna need that, that amount of funding. And that's how we set things up. And that's how we managed to get things going with cybersecurity in, uh, in Gemini. And we kind of took that model and moved a little bit forward in, in, in Noir Lab as, as well. And that's, that's worked. And now we're starting to see, of course, you know, um, uh, FTE assignments uh, for cybersecurity, but there's a there's a there's a way forward. And you know, it's nobody really gets cybersecurity. You know, nobody it's it's a thing that everybody needs, like you know, like Eric's saying, uh, but nobody really understands. You know, how much does it really cost to, to implement this? You know, what you know, there's a there's a, an item in or a paragraph in the rig that talks about you know three or twelve percent uh, between three and twelve percent of the IT budget. IT budget, not a cybersecurity budget. It's part of the IT budget. And um, yeah, and it's a huge range, you know, three to twelve percent. So, what does it actually include? What what um, what are you doing here with this? Uh, and that's the biggest thing. So, for us at least, you know, using that project um, you know, management methodology was a great way of making that visible to to the type of management about yeah what we needed to do and how much it was going to cost. So. Yeah, because I guess in cybersecurity, if you do your job right, they don't think you do anything, right? So, um, but um, I guess. Thinking about, you know, potential for a bright and shiny future, right? I mean, I, I, I know what we got out of going through something like the cohort, which is something like is is written in the rig, right? And I really think that um, NSF could benefit from having all of the facilities go through at least that beginning part where they look at the mission alignment and they look at uh, their needs and stuff in order to um, see how much cybersecurity is actually going to be a part of, of their mission, right? And then, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, NSF can can uh, find some some funds where people could ask for some cybersecurity project related uh, funds. Maybe it could come out of the the chips and science extra money that we we heard about yesterday. Um, but um, I guess if we if you think of it as a as as a project to get it going for uh, once again directed towards mission alignment and uh, protecting of the NSF investment. Yeah, now my earlier statement is essentially a complaint um, without a solution. I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the NSF could help by either mandating um, proposals include budget line items for cybersecurity, or if not mandate, then, you know, ask why don't you have cybersecurity in your proposal? You know, that could really direct funds I'd, towards that effort. I would probably say even a step further and make sure that you know, um, the, the, the funding not is just part of the proposal. It's actually, okay, we need cybersecurity. It's going to cost us this much. You know, can you give us the extra funds outside of the proposal of the, uh, the, of the, the new project? Because if you know your, your new project is 150 million, if you're going to have to take out a, a chunk, a delta out of that for cybersecurity, then you're not going to get the same, uh, same product, obviously. But if you have that plus something else, you know, extra funds from NSF, um, that'd be great. Um, then bake it in right from the start. You can, you can start developing that. Uh, it's, yeah, just a suggestion. Yeah, it, it's easier to bake in from the beginning than uh, Absolutely. try to wedge it in afterwards. But, but yeah, but I think at least going through the process so you know if it's important or not, right? That, that, even that costs money, so. Yeah, that, that should be probably part of the beginning of every single project. That's Craig's talking, and we also have a question up front, but Craig, go ahead. No, while, go we, ahead. while we get the mic down here, I think. I was just curious if Trusted CI has had cohorts outside of NSF or mixed organizations, um, other science funding organizations, DOE, NASA, anything international? Um. It's, it's a good question. And I uh, also, you know, Jim, you can feel free to chime in on sort of like the scope of Trusted CI as well. We are focused on um, NSF funded science, right? That is our, that is our mission. Um, there is kind of like a, a nexus where there's some projects like we engage with Scenic, which is uh, California networking, uh, which we, we found a couple of projects that are close enough that we basically brought them in. 
Um, our primary focus, though, is definitely NSF funded. So we have not, I mean, I don't think we've engaged with NASA. Um, we have some interactions with DOE, but we haven't had them in our cohorts as of yet. And um, yeah, I think that, that's kind of the long and short of it. That being said, um, you know, Trusted CI is not our full-time job for um, almost everyone on Trusted CI. And so we do have um, a fair amount of engagements where we, in, in our other, when we're wearing other hats, where we have a little bit of a broader um, perspective there. Um, was there a, a follow-up to that, that kind of scoping question? I, I would say, though, like if an NIH-funded facility put in an application to be a part of a cohort, it would certainly force us to answer that question, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and we, we, we've seen framework adoption in some, some large uh, NIH, you know, funded environments where they learned about the framework from coming to a training where it was a more open environment. Um, but in terms of being, you know, m you know, more engaged, yeah, there's kind of a mission scope thing for us, but I I'd love to have to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, but but, you know, the framework has been adopted in, in some DOD programs. Uh, the state of Indiana has adopted it as part of its standard for uh, local governments. So it, it, it is really meant to be able to be applied in a broader impact kind of way. So, you know, we're, we, we always perk up when we hear about, you know, opportunities to take, to take it broader. Yeah, that's helpful. I was mostly just asking because there are quite a few projects that are jointly funded. This mm. gets at some questions some other folks were asking. And so if you see some things that are not making sense, right, if there's an opportunity there. So that's where the question was coming from. Thank you. Yeah, those would, and, and we love complicated governance environments. So, you know, jointly funded, bring it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yay. We got another question here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's generally. Yeah, yeah, it was one. Yeah. So, I see a lot of discussion on frameworks for IT infrastructure, like, you know, we give out laptops to employees or like hosted inf infrastructure for downloading data sets and protecting them for public access versus not. But I don't ever hear any discussion about science-based infrastructure, like what controls are available on this Campbell data logger. Uh, yes, this thing we got from a vendor is still running Windows XP and we have to put it on the network. Yep. Um, I have an example on my project. We have 1,100 networks, which is running a version of Drop Bear from 2006 that we'll never get a firmware update for. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we start addressing those sorts of issues? Uh, that's my that's my <laughs> that's my nightmare. I, I guess I didn't get a chance to a answer that, but that that's my nightmare. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the major facilities, I think, it was. Um, uh, after the fact, right? After the fact, cybersecurity, not the one that's baked in from the start. Uh, I think a lot of major facilities suf suffer with exactly that. Uh, we've got examples of equipment running DOS still. Yeah, it's, but but it even, is a thing. even in a new facility, though, there's going to be equipment that is science, you know, directly science related to the problem that's trying to be yep, solved. Absolutely. That this is the only vendor that makes it, or you know, we can't yep. expect controls to be there. <laughs> yeah, and and typically these uh, the way this is set up, especially before the rig had any mention of uh, cybersecurity, was um, implement it, make it work. Right, you want to make that telescope move, or you want to make something happen, and, and nothing else. Um, even the new ones baking in from the start, you would probably put something, some kind of control around that, some kind of fence around that, and that would be the thing. So that would be, you know, looking at the control set, uh, you've also got to adapt for your, again, you know, you align it to your mission, right? So you've got to understand what are you protecting? What are you really worried about? Yeah, typically it's the, yeah, it's whatever's controlling your, your instrument or controlling the, the machine and whatever data that, that machine is producing. And, and that's, that's the critical thing. And you just have to build around it. You have to, have to decide, okay, which part of that, uh, that control set makes sense here? And which is, what do I just block off and figure out some other way of controlling? And, uh, and that's it. Uh, we, we've had to do that. You know, obviously, you know, having DOS, we, nobody wants that exposed uh, anywhere. So, so yeah, a lot of it is bespoke and trying to figure it out how it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, the operational technology piece of this, right, versus IT is a, is a major preoccupation of trusted CI and OmniSoc Research SOC. Um, so, you know, when, when we get really into our engagements, it's, it's an ever-present piece, right? You know, Rob did a, a really nice overview of, like, lots of ways this community is a little different from, you know, a typical, I don't know, Papa John's LLC or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, and and, and the, the operational technology piece is a, is a huge part of it. And whatever, you know, 800-171 just does not translate to a space that's really dominated. A lot of the crown jewels are really tied in with the OT as much as the IT. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'll take, oh, sorry, Eric, do you want to jump oh, in? I, I was just going to say, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, the, in, the, the weirder industrial control-like systems, and I think even, like, showed on the slide at the beginning, the epics, right? Th those are the things that are, uh, are the weirdest, but uh, as a um, uh, throw ahead or whatever, uh, Research Sock is actually looking at those kind of things too. They even have like uh, honeypots designed to be, to pretend to be industrial control systems to see when uh, something is trying to poke at some of the stuff you definitely don't want them poking at, right? So um, yeah, there, there are lots of cool products out there to, to help relieve the nightmare. And I'll just say that is a fantastic transition into our break, after which we will get to hear from Research Stock. But first, uh, join me giving a round of applause for our panel.